Well, I am very excited to be here to talk about negotiating with confidence and that you chose uh, the next 90 minutes to be with me. Uh, my name is Kathleen Burns Kingsbury. I am a wealth psychology coach. I'm an author. I own a company called KBK Wealth Connection. And primarily what I do is I am empower women and the people that serve them. So think financial advisors, CPAs, things like that, to feel more comfortable talking about money, earning money, negotiating money. And so I was really honored to be asked today uh, to present this workshop again this year. And uh, we're going to have some fun over the next 90 minutes. I'm going to give you some tips and tools, like the five steps that I think you need to take in order to prepare for a negotiation. Whether you are a business owner and you are negotiating fees with a client or a contractor, uh, whether you are somebody who works for somebody else and you're in a salaried position, all of these tactics can apply. So um, don't be shy in terms of uh, interrupting me. That's absolutely fine. Um, I have my fearless PowerPoint clicker, Jillian. Everybody, round of applause for Jillian. <laughs> I feel like I just want to give you something. Okay. <laughs> so if you want to start and go to the next slide, and I think you can click a couple times to get the whole slide up for me, if you don't mind. And if, uh, yep, keep going. I, have, I usually have a rhythm, but my clicker. So um, why should we negotiate? My guess is all of you know why we should negotiate as women. Um, but one of the statistics that's out there is the average woman loses over a million dollars through the course of her career by not negotiating her first salary. Now, I am not saying that if you did not negotiate your first salary, by the way, I didn't, who did? You go, yay. Um, you know, that it's too late. We're gonna talk about the skills where you can negotiate and make sure that you're earning what you're worth, and also if you're in a position to ask for a raise, to ask for a raise. But that's kind of a startling statistic. The other one is a little bit more recent, um, which is five billion is the amount, billion by the way, collectively, that women lose due to the gender wage gap. And we all know the gender wage gap is much more complicated than just all of us negotiating individually. But I am of the belief and the mission of my company is to make sure that as women, we are unleashing our true value, we're earning what we're worth, we're communicating our value. So we can take steps to individually close that gap. And then obviously there's systematic steps that need to happen as well. Um, Want to go to the next slide? We probably all know about the gender wage gap. This slide is a mm, little bit old, so maybe we're all the way up, white women, to 81 cents on every man's dollar. Um, and as you can see, depending on your um, race, or, race or ethnicity, it can really vary. And it's pretty dismal that we have had a gender wage gap for as long as we have. There's different per, uh, predictions about how long this gap's going to last, but it's not good. So we need to really make sure that we are not only learning the skills for ourselves, but also teaching those skills and role modeling to the women who are coming behind us. One caveat, I'm not saying that men are really great at this. Some men are really great at negotiating. They tend to negotiate in a style that's very different and often backfires for women. And there's a lot of men who I believe are suffering in silence. One of them is mountain biking right now. His name is Brian Kingsbury. He's my husband. <laughs> but there's a lot of men that aren't necessarily good at this. But collectively today, we are talking about women. And my passion is certainly empowering women um, because I really want to help with the gender wage gap and because I certainly have been the under earner. So it isn't like I'm standing up here and I was born a natural negotiator. I was actually taught that negotiation was rude and you don't want to get too full of yourself and all those kind of messages. I mean, my parents taught me lots of other great things, but I had to learn how to do this myself and I want to impart that on all of you. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, you can just have them all show up. So women, when we talk about breaking money silence, that's a, it's a book, it's my fifth book that I wrote, uh, but basically what it's about is the money talk taboo. And as women, it hits us worse than it hits men, if you look at the general population. This is all based on research, right? So there's gonna be exceptions to the rule, but 61% of women in one survey would rather talk about their own death than talk about finances with somebody else. Now that may fit for you, that may not fit for you, but that is a large percentage of us 
that aren't doing a great job of talking about money. The good news, so I'm a Gen Xer, um, as old as you can get and still call yourself a Gen Xer, so I'm, I'm a cusper, I'm hanging on before Boomer. Uh, and so what I see with millennials and with Gen Z, it's they're getting a little bit better at being able to know they should negotiate, that they can negotiate and develop these skills. So I think there's hope. Uh, if you want to compare the 61% to the general public, it's 44% of Americans would rather talk about death, dying, politics, uh, religion I think is thrown in there, uh, as opposed to talk about money with somebody else. So this money silence is pervasive, and often people will say, yes, you know, I can talk about money. Even the advisors I work with, I talk about money all day. But then you ask them about talking about salary, talking about your values around money, talking about what money means to you, or talking with an elderly parent about money can be really hard. So there's usually these pockets where we struggle with money silence. And of course, today we're focused in on the negotiation piece. Um, this is a statistic that I used last year when I presented at this conference, so it's a year old or so, but still, 19% less likely to ask for money. Now, I'm not telling you this to be Debbie Downer. I don't wanna focus on what we're not. I wanna focus on what we are and what we're capable of. So today is primarily gonna be about what you're capable of. Um, but I think having a little context to know hey, maybe I'm not alone, or wow, this really is an issue if you are somebody who came because you want to mentor other women in this regard. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. I want to change the story, and yes, because I'm Vermont, I'm doing the change the story thing. Um, I don't know with the Vermont women's uh, research, um, but I want to change the story. I want to make sure that instead of talking about what we're not, we're talking about what we are. Um, I think it's very normal to be anxious. The other day I did a webinar and it was a webinar to a group of professional women. And one of the questions they said, would my feelings around uh, negotiation, will the negative feelings ever go away? And I thought, what a great question. Now, I've been doing this for 20 years and have had my business for 20 years where I'm negotiating both individually with people as well as with larger companies, um, conferences for speaking. And I have to tell you, it doesn't completely go away, but it gets better and it changes and it gets different. And often what ends up happening is if you master one area of negotiation, you feel confident and that's the goal, then the context changes. Maybe it's a higher risk deal you're doing, or maybe you're negotiating a salary for a new company and, and that leads to some uncertainty. So it does get better, but you can learn the skills and I've helped hundreds of women be more uh, confident when it comes to talking about money and negotiation. Now, how many of you in the room um, have already negotiated today? Okay, what did you negotiate? Small children. Small children, God, God bless you, I mean, whatever. Yeah. Car use. Car use. How about in the back, someone raised their hand. I, I wasn't thinking it would be today's day. That's okay, you can share your example. Well, about fees as a business owner. Okay, good for you, yep. And there were some people over here who raised their hand. You in the back? What'd you negotiate today? Um, another step level. Oh, today. Oh, not today. Oh, okay. I was like, wow, you are busy. <laughs> 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 so what I love is you got right away that negotiation can be business things that maybe didn't happen on a Saturday morning. And in some ways, I, I love that because that means you weren't overworking. Um, and it's kids, car use, who's going to get the milk? Um, we negotiate all the time, and all of those skills are transferable skills. We just often get to the idea of like, oh, we're going to talk about money, and what does that salary mean to me, and what is that compensation package? And we start to get anxious and uncomfortable. You can go to the next slide if you don't mind. So, very briefly, let me tell you a little bit about my story, because I am standing up here after having done a fair amount of work on my own relationship with money. Um, when I started out in my business, um, I've had a couple of different businesses, but for the last 20 years, it's been KBK Wealth Connection and a coaching consulting training company. And so when I started out, I was transitioning from the field of psychology and healthcare. And, you know, very noble field, loved it, did it for 15 years. But you go from healthcare to 
financial services in the mindset and the culture around money is very, very different. I'm not even going to judge it. It's just different. And so I wanted, 20 years ago, I said, I want to be a keynote speaker and I want to do this nationally. And some of my therapist friends, they, they'll say it now, they were kind of like, mm, okay, like, sure. And uh, I was pretty determined to do that, but I didn't really think through the money part. I mean, I was fortunate in that I could change jobs and know I was going to eat because of my husband for a year. Um, but didn't make a lot of money the first year, didn't know how to communicate my value, had a lot of imposter syndrome, right? What's this therapist, former therapist doing in this financial services space? Like I knew I wanted to do it. By the way, before that I had been in banking and finance, so it wasn't just completely a dart, but um, so I blended the two together. But I knew I wanted to do it and I knew I could do it. And so I started to get some momentum. I started to do a little bit better at communicating my value. And I ended up on the first main stage presentation I've ever had. It was a Merrill Lynch conference. It was right around after the Great Recession, because I can remember all the signs um, outside didn't say Merrill Lynch. And I was like, why doesn't it say Merrill Lynch? And that's when people were like threatening Merrill Lynch. So very safe conference to be at. So I ended up going up on the main stage. Um, the way the business tends to work when you're speaking is a, is a fund company or an investment company hires the speaker. They pay to be at the conference, you pay to be on the, and then you're on the main stage. So I charged what I thought was an outrageous amount of money. Um, I hardly remember being on stage because it was really stressful the first time. But I got off stage and the two people from the investment firm who had hired me said, great job, that was awesome, Kathleen, you, you kicked it out of the park. And I was like, oh, thank God, because <laughs> I don't really remember being up there. And I looked at them and I said, oh, I said, that's, that's why you pay the big bucks. I meant it. They started giggling. And you know, in the moment, you want to be professional, but I thought, oh, they're not really laughing with me. And so then I started to pay attention. The gentleman after me, same stage, same audience, same conference, made four times what I made. And, and then the, the kicker was once we're done with all that and I figure that out, you walk out into the, um, the reception area to have like their happy hour. There were more free drinks, martinis, and crab legs so they paid more <laughs> basically to feed these people just at happy hour than me. Anyway, long story short, it was a wake up call and it was a moment of, oh my goodness, I got to do something differently. So I started working on my relationship with my money and that means I started looking at my money personality. Why was I so likely to ask for so little? Part of it was the culture I came from in financial services. Part of it was my family upbringing. And part of it I think had to do with me just not feeling like I, I had value to provide even though I wanted to be in this place. Flash forward, now I say no to probably 80% of the speaking engagements um, because they don't want to pay my full fee and I'm fine with that because I'm in a certain spot, I know my value and it, it's not always easy. There are days where that is harder than others um, but I've learned that I know what my value is and so in sharing that story, what I want to tell you is that whatever your story is, you can go from doubt to believing in yourself. And that I'm standing up here, yeah, I have degrees, I've written books, I've done all that stuff, but I really get it because I've been there. I've been that business owner or that employee that was afraid to bump their rates up or ask for more. So just have that context. If you want to go to the next slide. So if you're sitting there, and whether it is you work for a company or you work for yourself, and you're caught in this cycle, you are in the right place. And the cycle is, you're kind of uncertain, like what value do I really provide? You tend to, as a result, do people-pleasing negotiation. It becomes more about them than it becomes about you. Often, when we do that, we end up overworked or underpaid or resentful. I've certainly been there. We have a desire to earn more, but we just don't know how to go about it. And if we work for ourselves, we worry about losing clients. If we work for somebody else, we're worried we'll upset the boss or we won't be seen as appreciative. We should just be lucky that we have this job. And we end up then really operating from fear as opposed to standing in our value and operating from power. That is a very common cycle I see with a lot of my coaching clients. And it's certainly one um, that my sense is some of us in this room have gone through, including myself. So today we're gonna flip that 
Next slide. And we're going to talk about what are the steps to successfully negotiating. Now, to successfully negotiate, I'm going to give you five steps. We all know this is something you could study for the rest of your lives. <laughs> but my hope is, and it, the five steps are on your handout, my hope is by the end of our time today, you will have a sense of what do I need to do in order to do my next negotiation. Now, whether that's, like you said, fees with clients, whether that's salary from an employee, I want you to kind of think about as we go through, um, and a little bit later we'll do an interactive exercise where I'll have you specifically think about a situation, but how can you apply this to your life? Um, is there a scenario that, that's percolating here around negotiation that I haven't touched upon? Yes. Um, I'm just curious, based on what you had just said in the last slide, um, you said that you were turning down opportunities because they weren't willing to pay what you mm -hmm. deserve. And I'm sure you're going to touch on this at some point, but I'm really curious about how to do that when you really need the money. It is hard. It is hard. Um, so I will touch upon that later, but I think the short is that, and I've worked with people, um, you know, I know that I have a certain sense of privilege that I know I can eat, um, but often what I find is if you trust in yourself and you turn down that opportunity that's a low cost opportunity, if you give it space, and I understand it may not be a lot of space, something better, more aligned would be will come your way. Or you can negotiate something where you're getting something else. Case in point, people volunteer for this conference. I'm getting film. So it isn't always about the money. It can be about something that's really important to you, um, but it's a great question. So feel free to bring it back up later as well. Yes. Divorce. Oh, that's, I, that's a great thing that we're not going to talk about today. Uh, <laughs> I did it for myself, but I've got two friends who are. <laughs> I know people who do a great job. Two, two words on that. If you are going through a divorce or contemplating a divorce, there are people who specialize. Um, there's certified divorce financial analysts. There's also financial advisors that specialize. There's also places where you can get coaching. I know all of those resources. So if anybody has that situation, or wants those resources. Um, some of the skills are the same. Uh, what typically happens in a divorce is it, it is really emotional, right? So a lot of times women will be like, let's just get it done. And the let's just get it done often isn't useful in the long run. Totally get it in the short run. Um, but yes, we are not talking about divorce today. I was, gonna, I was like, you know what? Nobody puts baby in the corner. Nobody puts Jillian in the corner. Yes. I just want to add, because I'm in a, a situation, I feel like I'm going through a divorce, that's how I associate yeah. it, but it's a business um, separation, yeah. right? And so I think there's a blend here is what I'm hearing. There's definitely, you know, we're in the process of negotiating to do a spin-off yeah. of a business that's closing, but the owner is so emotional and, you know, it feels like a divorce yeah. going on. And so there's another part where we're just surrendering just to get through it, because yeah. on the other side we'll be better off. Yes, very, very, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, businesses breaking up and biz partners getting together, just like a marriage, except for you're not in love. So <laughs> it's complicated. So yes, a lot of this can be applied to that. Yep. Knowing that you're worth more and wanting to ask for more, but also knowing there's others willing to do the job for free. Oh yeah. yeah. Or that they're willing to not have the job be done. Okay, and so um, say a little bit more before we move on. So um, in this particular instance, it's trying to do a district-wide safety initiative yeah. so that all of the staff and students are safe. Um, and in the past, let's say seven years, there's been somebody doing who was getting paid nothing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, they could easily just decide, well, we'd rather go back to not having nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And so then it becomes, um, because it sounds like, without you saying it, you're passionate about making this happen. Mm -hmm. And I have three students, it's three of my own children in the district that okay. I want to also make sure. Okay. And so it's hard, because we're going to talk about something called a BATNA, best, um, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. For them, it might be not investing. For you, it might be figuring out an interim step. So when we get there, 
think about that and bring that back up because it is a tough thing. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And whether there should be a sliding fee. Anyway. That's yeah. No, that's a great question. So there's geography, there's the type of industry, there's the type of organization. And so often it's having a pricing strategy that is in line with you standing in your value and also appreciating that people have different budgets. Yeah. I'm German. I'm from Germany. Yeah. And about to establish business here, I used to have a business in Germany, uh -huh. so maybe like the foreign people, I know I'm privileged to be white and yeah. whatever, but uh, I'm from a Western country, but still it's uh, something different to make your way into the economy, yeah. and the economy and the business world. So you have a lot to learn, and also how do you learn kind of the customs of here versus there? I have to just as yeah, yeah, very different, I, I assume. I have two, I have to just disclose this. I have two um, virtual assistants, both are from Germany, but live in Dubai. So I have people for you to talk to. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. So the five steps are understanding your mindset, and in a minute we're gonna do a little mindset work. Um, two, know your value, which sounds simple, but we all know it, it, it isn't. So your value both externally, like in terms of what somebody's willing to pay, but also internally standing in that value. Um, assessing your interests, what is important to you, and going into a negotiation and being aware of, how do I think about this as a package, and what, is, what are my interests, and the part we tend to not do, what's the other person interested in? Because often a good collaborative negotiation which women do the best, I think. A competitive negotiation is more a negotiation, you know, you're going to get uh, buy a used car from somebody. You're never going to see the person again. You can get kind of competitive. You're not going to develop a long-term relationship. Um, but when we are, you know, wanting to keep long-term clients, we're wanting to, um, you know, stay at the same firm, then it's more of a collaborative. And so it's really thinking about people's interests. Anticipating objections, nobody likes a no, but the beauty of a no is it gets you closer to the yes, but it takes a while to kind of appreciate that. And then of course you gotta ask. So we're gonna talk about it towards the end how you can get into a place where you're gonna be most effective and feeling strong in that ask. You are just super, like I'm gonna take you on the road. Um, okay, so we're gonna do a mindset. Anybody heard or done work around money mindsets? You're nodding yes. Okay, uh, a money mindset is how you think and feel about money. It impacts how you behave. The thing with a money mindset is we all have them, but because we're in a society that doesn't talk a lot about money, we typically don't even kind of know what our thoughts and beliefs are about it. They live kind of in the unconscious mind. And what ends up happening, or what the research shows in wealth psychology, is between the ages of five and 15, we often pick up on messages like you know when to save, when to talk about money, when to not talk about money, when to spend, um, and things about negotiation as well. At 15, it doesn't mean that it, you can't change it, but often that's the foundation. And so sometimes when we are negotiating or talking about money with a partner or talking about money uh, with a parent, whatever the case may be, and we get you know, kind of black and white and childlike and, and feel kind of these strong feelings, it's because of that little kid in you that has this money mindset. So part of this work, we're, we're gonna do a little, we're gonna scratch the surface, part of this work is bringing those thoughts to your conscious awareness so as an adult we can all decide, does this serve me? Does this get in the way? And the beauty of a money mindset, it's a collection of thousands of thoughts, so we're just gonna focus on five in your negotiation realm but the beauty of a money mindset is once it becomes conscious, you can start to make some choices. And everybody in this room has parts of your money mindset that are really healthy that help you and parts of your money mindset that probably are getting in the way. And that's just being a human. So um, let me go to the next slide and then we'll do a little exercise. 
So you don't have to disclose, but if anybody's been in cognitive behavioral therapy, you have seen this before. <laughs> uh, when I practiced uh, uh, clinically for 15 years, I did cognitive behavioral therapy with a lot of uh, women around their self-esteem, their body image and stuff. And so then I brought this, uh, along with some of my other colleagues, to the world of money psychology. So basically how it works is when you have a thought, you automatically have an emotion and you have a behavior and there's an outcome. And it happens like that. And it happens all the time. And so for instance, if you think, um, I don't know, if I ask for a raise, my boss isn't gonna like me, whether you're conscious of it or not, your emotion will probably be anxiety. Your behavior in this model, I'm going technical here, behavior is actually your physical, like what happens, maybe your hands sweat, your heart races. And the outcome may be like, ah, just do it next year. But if you think, you know what, I'm kind of anxious to ask for a raise, but I know I need to do this to take care of myself and my family, you probably will still feel anxiety. Maybe it'll be a little bit less, so that'll be the emotion. But you'll also feel a little sense of empowerment or determination. The behavior may be, instead of you know, feeling like you're gonna have a heart attack, um, you figure out how to breathe and calm the anxiety down, and then you go in and you have the uncomfortable conversation and build up that muscle. So that typically is how it works. So what we're gonna do is just try to get to some of those thoughts we're not gonna go as deep here today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about how to uncover those thoughts around negotiation and then what you can do about them. So if you, you can do it on the handout. I'm sorry, I don't have a fill in the blank for this. Um, I'd like to blame my assistant, but I did the handout. So if you see a typo, it's me as well. And I'm gonna ask you, um, and if you want, do you, do you wanna come out or do you wanna sit I'll, there? I'll sit here. Okay. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to complete five separate uh, statements. Now what's important, nobody else in the room is going to see it. Be as honest as possible. Don't be politically <laughs> correct. And it's just your mindset in the moment. You don't have to be wed to it. And because it's Saturday morning, I wrote down my five statements. <laughs> okay. And it's gonna go quick because the thing about this and the thing about your mindset, it's automatic. It's not like, oh, this is what I think after I think about it for 30 minutes. Okay, here we go. So complete the sentence with whatever comes to mind. Negotiating my salary or fee, whatever fits for you, negotiating my salary or fee is blank. I was taught negotiation is. Women who negotiate are. Women who negotiate are. Men who negotiate are. My biggest fear when negotiating is. My biggest fear when negotiating is. Okay. Next slide. So what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna give you about five minutes. I'm gonna have you break into twos or threes, like you can jump up with the people behind you or whatever you need to do. Um, get into a groups of two or three and we're gonna have you look at your mindsets together. Again, you can share your specific responses. You don't have to. Um, but really what I want you to be talking about is I want each person in the dyad or the triad to identify 
how they think their mindset impacts their success in negotiating. Big question, and I'm not giving you a ton of time, so do the best you can. And then I want you to identify one area that's problematic. So one area that really helps you and one area that's problematic. Let's just focus on those two simple things. I'll give you about five minutes. I'll check in and see where we're at, and then we'll process it as a larger group. If you want to sprint to the back of the room to get a little exercise, you can, or you can turn to someone who's next to you. Oh, perfect. We good. No, wait. There's a quick question. I want to. It's a great question. We're not critiquing. So, for instance, uh, it's Dina. Dina would say, I think my mindset helps me this way for success. I think this is the one area it's problematic. OK, not critiquing each other's mindsets. No, I know what you're saying. No, but it's a great question. Okay, we're going to have more, another chance to connect in our groups or with other people in the room. So I always hate once I get people going to be like, now that you've broke money silence, zip it. Okay, so before we move on in terms of how you can change uh, a problematic thought, I would love to hear a few thoughts that came up in your groups around either successes or areas that you need to improve. Um, and, you know, feel free to ask your partner permission if you're talking about them. <laughs> Dina. Our, ours is like emotion based. We both have sort of these big hearts and feel like sort of we're socialists. We want to help the little, the little people, <laughs> yeah. so to speak, yeah. and some ideas about money being bad. and. You know, not you know your value you're not a good person if you're really wealthy like the yeah. childhood ideas and i think emotion was a big like you want to take care of the people and make sure they have what they need mm -hmm. so taking care of someone might mean what in terms of negotiation lowering your fee okay yeah okay. yeah especially in the work i do like i know that there's a need i know that they would benefit mm -hmm. and it's really extra hard to say you know to yeah. stick with my guns and not waver okay so part of it is we being a good person, worrying about the other person in the negotiation. And I, I totally, I've worked nonprofit, I understand what you're talking about. One of the things we tend to not think about is what if I role modeled something to them by sticking to my fee? Or what if I created a lot of wealth for myself so then I could help more of those people in a different way? So, um, but emotions is a big one. The other thing that I do is I do money personality assessments, and I have a guess who you two are already. Um, and it's not bad, you're caring, emotional people, but often people who have a nurturing money personality, if that indeed was the case, do tend to struggle with charging because you're worried more about the other person, which is both nice but also problematic. So it's a strength and a challenge. How about other folks? What came up for you in your groups? Either a strength or, or a, a challenge? Yes. We had um, a lot of parallels in our group. Uh, we have a lot of confidence in negotiating salaries in certain contexts, and we have, um, it's a lot harder for us when we are working in the community and, or, or, you know, when we know that the people 
that we're working with individuals who don't necessarily have the means. Yep. Which is not dissimilar to what Rena yep. was saying. So what makes you confident in a, the salary zone? Like what helps you stand in confidence and negotiate there? When we are, when in, in the past when we worked for corporations or wealthy families that we know yeah. have abundant, mm -hmm. more than, more than uh, the means to pay us what we know they're worth. Okay. So again, similar, setting fees based on what the other person can afford. And again, by no means am I minimizing that challenge in community work. I don't, but but also there is a way in which um, it's interesting because a lot of times we're mind reading the other person, and sometimes you have that data, sometimes you don't. Uh, some of the women that I work with will kind of determine without having any financial data whatsoever, and your situations could be different, but, um, and decide that this person really can't afford it. And what ends up happening is they're projecting their mindset onto somebody else. Sometimes we work with people who are gonna make it a choice to invest in our services if we give them a chance. Uh, again, I understand there's caveats depending on what type of organization you work for. Way of yeah. navigating that. Let's share. Oh, I had a uh, negotiation recently with a client, and um, we met, and she told me what she wanted, and I put together a proposal, and she said, "Oh, it's way out of my budget. I can't do it." And so I said, "Well, what is your budget? Let's see if we can find something that works for you, and also works for me." And we both ended up like I didn't feel like my services and my knowledge, like I wasn't lowering my fee. I was charging my fee, but just making what mm -hmm. she wanted work but not being extra. So you were negotiating deliverables. Yeah. Yeah. A great thing to be able to do and you can actually do this in an employee situation and by that what I mean is it's coming to the table with a package and this is going to come up later but a package of things that you want that are in your best interest. So when a fee comes up or some you can go to well, I can offer this $5,000 package for $3,500 because I'm going to remove, you know, like, I don't know if I'd want to use the word remove because then people feel like they're losing out. But, you know, some language around how this package is, a, is a, you know, a, a basic package versus a preferred package because language does matter. But that, that's a great point. Um, and thank you for putting that out there. Any other thoughts before we move on? Yep. Well, Julian helped me see that. Um, that last question about the biggest fear is really kind of telling the mindset that was very helpful for me yep. to kind of realize and I kind of concluded that maybe I've only charged one person what I feel is a, the right amount out of my five clients right now. Oh, yeah, I'm over, I feel like I'm overcharging one and maybe undercharging the others. Yeah. And one feels right. <laughs> May I ask, and you can say, no, Kathleen, I don't want to share in the group on a Saturday morning. What is the biggest fear? Um, that I wrote? Yeah. Um, making a mistake that I would overcharge or undercharge. Oh, okay. So somehow the fear is I'm going to make a mistake. Yeah. As opposed to we need to get you to a place where, like, my biggest fear or I may make a mistake, but I can recover. I do feel like, I do feel like that, yeah. if you really ask me, but, yeah. but that still was my... <laughs> yeah, you're a knee, yeah. knee jerk. Yeah. Because yeah. one of the things we forget, and it's not always the easiest, but we can renegotiate things. Like, we often think it's set in stone. Um, and it isn't set in stone, but it does require a certain um, ability to emotionally tolerate the fact that it's not going to be tied up in a bow. I'm a big check it off the list kind of gal. So I've had to learn like, you know, sometimes waiting is actually the best negotiation. Some of the negotiations that, I wouldn't even say one, because I think it's really about finding what's valuable for both people, has been like, I was away for the weekend and then like an extra Monday. And normally I'm a follow up kind of gal to a fault. And uh, because I didn't respond on Monday, they gave me what I wanted on Monday while I was away. And I was <laughs> like, hmm, maybe I should just draw it out a little bit more. Um, so thank you for doing that. We're going to talk a little bit about how to change it uh, briefly, and then we're going to go into um, starting to really figure out how do you communicate your value, because it's one thing to know your mindset, then what, what do you do about it? Can you go to the next slide, please? So in terms of reframing, you take your thought, your feeling, you take your thought and you shift it, you reframe it, you think about it a little bit differently, and it's going to result in you 
potentially having different emotions, less intense emotions, and a different behavior. Now this takes time. It isn't like today I'm going to say reframe it that way and you're going to be like, wouldn't it be great? I'd be talking about wealthy. I'd be really wealthy. I'd just be like, ping. You'd walk out the door and be a great negotiator. Um, but I gave an example. So if you want to click through the example, uh, if I, and I used this before, if I ask for a raise, my boss won't like me. So here's the thing, and I think I overheard in your group, I may have overheard incorrectly, but often because we have emotions about these thoughts, we think they're facts. So you have to start thinking, is that true or is that just kind of a feeling or, you know, my perspective? Is that actually a fact? So you have to look for the evidence. And so in this case, um, this person didn't have any evidence. They've never asked for a raise. They have no idea if their boss will like them or not. And so what's another way to reframe that and think about it so it might free them up to negotiate? If I ask, research shows I'll be more respected no matter what the outcome. I've actually heard often women leaders, but I've heard male leaders as well who are doing hiring, like they offer a job and a salary and a package and they're kind of bummed out when you don't negotiate back. I've even had some women leaders say to the candidate who happened to be a female, you really are going to want a counteroffer. <laughs> you know, like I'm trying to help you do that. So whatever your thought is, I ask you, to, what's the fact? Is it a feeling? Is it a fact? If you have trouble deciding that, ask somebody who is not emotionally involved at all. And then start to look at what's a new way. And it isn't that this first thought's going to go away. I worked with somebody in a mentor coaching group where what she decided to do is instead of changing it to this thought, which I came up with, she said, if I ask for a raise, I'm role modeling to the women behind me, this is what you're supposed to do. So in that moment, she couldn't do it for herself, but she could do it for the community of women. And then she was able to move forward and, and deal with some of the feelings and get prepared and that kind of thing. Make sense? Okay. Can you go to the next slide? She's like, no, I can't. Huh. Keep going. It could be um, the way I did it. Okay. Step two is knowing your value. So two parts, right? There's your knowing your value externally, and that's where geography comes in. That's where... Um, kind of the industry comes in, it comes what you're doing for a living, uh, and then also knowing your value intrinsically. Like, I know I'm worth this. I know instead of lowering my fee, I'm going to negotiate the deliverables. My guess is, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, you probably felt a lot happier about the deal and less resentful than if you had lowered your fee. Because eventually what ends up happening when we're under earning is we, we do get a little angry. Um, I know I did. So uh, if you go to the next, you can just put up all the Okay, so you want to research your competition and your compensation. Those are really close words. <laughs> compensation. And you, does everybody know about like glassdoor.com, indeed.com? It's okay if you don't. Um, does someone want to say what they are? Somebody who nodded, yes, I know what that is. Do you mind sharing what, oh, you're like, no, I don't want to share. No, it's. Okay. Um, mine's, so Glassdoor. Can you hear her? They, no. they have listings, but they. Um, it's required to contribute. You have to tell something about your salary history yes. or the environment, or is indeed just listing that you can go on. And say yes. So something like an indeed.com, uh, glassdoor.com is collectively gathering some information. So if you use the information, you have to provide some information. It's my understanding it's confidential uh, for, for the most part. Uh, there's other ones too out there. Uh, I think it's payscale.com. All you have to do is Google, you know, salaries. I think there's even a salary.com. In the old days, I'm going to pull my generation. We didn't have that. Um, but that's one way you can do it. So you can do it online. If you work for yourself, then you look like I'm a trainer in the financial services industry, so I look for that position. And, and so what's closest to what I do? The other research I encourage people to do is to tap into your network. This is invaluable. And for years, even though it was legal to ask each other our salaries the, from a federal standpoint, companies have told us it's not. That has shifted and changed. Now, you may not feel comfortable turning to your colleague, or if you work for yourself in a business, you may you know, have to break money silence, but there's different ways of doing it. And networking with people who are either in a similar position or have hired someone like you can give you incredible data especially because it's going to be more geographic, it may be more specific to what you're doing, uh, and it can be really helpful. 
So the over-under technique is something I, I learned from a woman I interviewed on my podcast, Breaking Money Silence. She uh, wrote the book, I think it's called Awkward Money Conversations. She is a, because we're recording, I'm not going to say the word, kick, you know what, uh, millennial. Uh, and she um, came up with this over-under technique, which basically is you email someone on LinkedIn that may have a a uh, similar job or maybe hiring somebody like you, and you you know, you know develop the relationship. This isn't the first email. Um, but eventually you say, hey, I'm in the midst of preparing for a negotiation. Here's a range of what I'm thinking this job or you know this contract or whatever is in. Do you think I'm over or under? So that way they don't have to disclose exactly unless they want to. And you also give them an out. It's okay if you prefer not to respond. More often than not, people will give you a sense of what it is. As a entrepreneur, this is what I've done and I learned this from my husband. <laughs> and it works. So you often are negotiating and you're trying to figure out what their budget is. And so you say, you know, what budget do you have in mind? And most people say, well, we don't know, even though they know. We don't know. It's like this whole game you play. And so if you go back with a really ridiculous range, often people will give you a number. So if I am pitching a 10 or a $15,000 speech, say, it's just more concrete than other stuff. If I'm pitching that, then I would say, oh, you know, if I, you know, if I came in at like, I don't know, 100,000, would that be too much? Everybody laughs. And they're like, oh, no, 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 more like 15. Ooh. It works a lot. And I don't always use it, but it's something you can take and run with it if it's helpful for you. I, I don't know how it would work for a boss in a salary situation, um, but it's a way of kind of getting a range of what their budget is. But even if you work for a company, they should have some guidelines, most of them, around what's the range for your particular job and your job description. So you can get this data, you have to ask for it, but tapping into your network, I would not be where I am if I didn't have a network of men and women who were willing not only to share about money and finance, but also to share you know, context to help me um, when I'm struggling. And so I really encourage you, if you don't have that, then this is a great conference to start building um, those types of connections. Look, I thought it was my clicker. <laughs> which you can do, which I will do for the next time. Okay, next page, please. Oh, important thing. You gotta believe in yourself. So. Communicating your value is not only having the concrete data, it's also believing in yourself. So if you go to the next slide, here's what I encourage my clients to do. And I do it as well. It's called a success journal. And so you get, um, you can get it as pretty or as cheap as you want, doesn't matter. And you start putting, you can just um, drop down the menu, uh, you start putting these things in it. So the easy part is, what are my accomplishments? What are my degrees? What are my certifications? Uh, what are my s concrete skills? That's a little easier. The hard part, and this is where the value really lies, is what type of impact have I had in the work that I've done? Maybe that's a case study. And it doesn't matter what your profession is. Like, what was the problem? How did I help with the solution? And what was the bottom line impact? It often is time, revenue, um, efficiency, expanding something, growing a business. And some positions a little harder to show that, I get it, but that's in general. So you wanna write down case studies and you don't wanna wait till the day before your performance review or the day before you're going to clients to ask for a deal. You wanna keep these as time goes on. And one of the things uh, a good strategic marketing consultant that I've worked with told me is she said, when somebody hires you, it may be in a firm, but I'm thinking more for the, the uh, business owners here. When they hire you, right when you have your first meeting, why me, why now? Now I ask why now, but I don't often ask why me. And why do you ask at the beginning as opposed to the end? because they're all jazzed up to work with you. And they might have a different perspective, but that at the beginning, it may just get better, but they have this perspective of like, I just invested. So it's an interesting question. And then awards, credentials, degrees. If you don't have awards, credentials, and degrees, don't worry so much about it. There's two types of trust you need to build in a negotiation. One is competency-based, which is 
you know, your degrees, and they're worth something, I'm not saying they're not, but you know, awards, your credentials, which is, tends to be what we talk about. The other is benevolent-based trust, which is caring, which is showing empathy. Stories that are similar, that show impact, similar to what your client might be looking for, similar to what your boss is invested in. Those are the things that actually foster the kind of trust you need to have a healthy, good result in a negotiation. If you want to go to the next slide. So here's just more concretely in terms of making a business case. One of the mistakes that I see women make, and it's well intended, is negotiating and saying things like, well, I have a longer commute, or uh, I have to get additional childcare, or, um, you know, you, I just deserve it because I deserve it. Now, all of those things can be true. But that isn't going to help your boss or your client justify why they're investing in you. You need to give them a business case. Even in a nonprofit, you need to give them a business case. And so, if you want to go to the next, think about, and it may take you a while to figure this out if you're not, like if you're in sales, it's pretty easy to be like, oh, I increased revenue by so much. Um, but if you're in another position, it may take you a while to think about how you save someone time or money, how you improve productivity, like what is your impact? How, if you are a team leader, you make the team feel welcome and excited so then they can go out and reach their business goals. You know, it doesn't have to be direct. One client I worked with, she was internal at a uh, insurance firm and she came up with this, that she managed four lead carriers, so that basically is just different insurance companies, um, that accounted for more than half of the annual premium sales. 80 million. She had been passed over and passed over and passed over, but she had never really done the work. She just assumed the boss knew, and by the way, whoever your boss is, they're busy and they aren't gonna be in your head, like it's great to think that they're gonna be, but they're not gonna be in your head. So you have to really spell it out. She spelled it out, she got a new title, and she got an increase. So it's really taking time, and this is kind of a homework piece to make that case. Okay, can you go to the next one? I wonder if I put additional, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, so any questions about that before we do value statements, which is another interactive piece we're going to do? Okay. So what I want to do is put this into practice for you. So we looked at your mindset, how that impacts you, what's strengths, what's problematic, how you can work on that. In terms of your value statement, it's really about how can I communicate the result of working with me on my negotiating partner, whoever that is. So um, let me think about, so, so for me as a coach in wealth psychology, I might say something of, um, I'm a master's level clinician who's worked with hundreds of women around their relationship with money using my behavioral, what do I use? I'm using my behavioral um, finance skills my coaching and counseling skills in my business experience to help them ask and get paid what they're worth. And then I might do, if you have the data, um, in one instance, as I worked with Michelle, and as a result of our work over three months coaching engagement, she doubled her income. It's like, it's great when you have that, you don't always have that. So for you, and it's not easy to do this, but I'm gonna break you into groups you can use the same group if you want to meet someone new. Feel free to jump across the aisle. Um, and what I want you to do is use this formula in general. You can tweak it a little bit. Um, but talk about what are your accomplishments, what are the skills you use, and what's the impact. And the impact is often time, revenue, money can also be an emotional benefit. I help women feel more confident. I let, you know, whatever it might be for yours. So I'm going to give, let me see my time. We're rocking and rolling, ladies. Um, let's go seven minutes. I know that's quick. Break into groups. And then I do want you to give each other feedback. So maybe take a minute or two to write something out. It's going to be super drafty. It's not going to be final. And then you work in your groups and just give each other feedback. Because often somebody else 
looking at our value statement can kind of tweak one thing and you're like, ooh, that's it. Okay. I'll see you in seven minutes. Okay, I see some good work going on, so I'm excited about it. So we are definitely going to end at 11.45, so I will get through all this material, I promise you. Um, but I wanted to make sure you had time on the mindset and you also had time on this, because this is the kind of stuff that you'll be like, I'm going to do that later. And then we typically don't do it later. So I would love to hear one or two value statements. So you just stand up and tell us. I know, frightening, right? Maybe I'll send you a t-shirt afterwards. I didn't bring them with me. Um, what's your value? Just one value. Come on, somebody. Go for it. You don't have to stand up, though. See, you're negotiating deliverables all the time, aren't you? <laughs> um, I do website design, so I um, accomplish creating a website for a local politician using my design and development skills, and he was reelected. <laughs> That's a good one. You! Excellent. Does anybody want to follow with not such a good one? <laughs> Just setting the bar. No, I'm kidding. You can give it a try. We can workshop it really quick. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, good. You're going to get something, Jillian, as opposed <laughs> to giving. You don't want to stand up either, I take it? We started a trend. Oh, look, you're like, I'm up. Uh, through my Feldenkrais skills, I have helped Bob, a farmer, learn to where, recognize when he's about to do too much instead of when just after he's done that, which has expanded his capacity to keep working rather than hurt his back. Oh, nice. High five. <laughs> you did it. Awesome. Awesome. Great. One more as I click the slide myself. Don't be such Oh, went the wrong way, so thank goodness you're here with me. Job security. <laughs> so we're, we sh you're right, it's a little funky. Okay. Well, you can brag at lunch to each other about your value statements. I want to make sure you're out for lunch on time. Okay, so we have identified our mindset. We have looked at our value. Now we're going to assess interests. So when we're talking about assessing interests, First of all, like what motivates us to ask for more or want more? What is in it for us? So for instance, um, I'll just use this because it's easy and it's happening right now. Um, first of all, I love presenting at this um, conference. I like to be here. I love connecting with all of you. I don't get to present live very much. So I have an interest in getting out, either workshopping something or doing something I've done before that I've known has been effective to get out and actually be in person. My other interest is um, if I can get, and, and this is gonna sound crass, but it's true, uh, social media coverage, and this was just a bonus with the video. So all of those interests are being met. What is their interest? Their interest in, in hiring me uh, or inviting me to come and present is they want somebody who's a skilled presenter who can talk on specifically on the topic of negotiation. And, um, and they know based on past experiences that people get value out of it. So it's the meeting of the minds. And so the part that I want you to do for your client or for your uh, supervisor, boss, leadership team is think about it. What is important to me? 
and then prioritize those interests and what is important to that other person or that committee or whoever is because that's the part we forget to do. Negotiation is about us standing on our value and communicating our value. It's also about making the other person's job easier to say yes. So if you go to the next slide, and you can just click the whole thing down, um, this is just an example of somebody who's negotiating, um, say it's after the pandemic, or they still are looking at different types of working, you are working for them and you say, well, I know that for I need a raise because I want to increase my income, cost of living, additional skills that I have. Uh, I ideally want flex time, I want stretch assignments because I'm the type of person who wants to keep growing, and I want tuition reimbursement. So this is the bundle that I want. You'd also have a number or range that you'd be shooting for. The boss then, whoever the boss is, says, well, I really need to retain um, my employees. I want to build my team. I want to develop my team. I have been given a mandate to have everybody back in the office full time, and I want to keep my expenses low. So where is the blend between this? You're just guessing the boss is one, by the way. But taking an educated guess is better than being unprepared when you walk in the room. Do you see where it might? Team development and tuition reimbursement go together. Now here's the tricky part. He wants to reduce, I shouldn't say he, that, that's a stereotype, like a doctor. Uh, this person, he or she, or they, um, basically is looking to keep expenses low. Now this may seem contraindicated, but if you want flex time or suppose you want a hybrid situation, then part of it is, okay, I understand I'm gonna want more in salary, but having me work at home two days a week is gonna reduce the overhead and then however it's gonna reduce the overhead. Or it's gonna make me more productive. So it's always looking and just thinking about those things before you walk in the negotiation room. And by the way, often negotiations are more than one conversation, they're a series of conversations. But having done this prep work is really important. Can you go to the next slide? I keep looking at that clock, but it's been one o'clock for a long time. <laughs> the other thing you need to do before you go into the negotiation room is think about your BATNA. BATNA is just an acronym for Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. What are your options? if you don't get the agreement you want. In that situation, it might be, okay, my BATNA as the employee might be, I will settle for tuition reimbursement and a review in three months of my salary. So I wanted the salary increase now, but let's do, and you get everything in writing, by the way, from clients, from, in an email, just something documented, not because people are evil or whatever, it's because people forget. And so having something in writing after you've agreed to something is important, even if it's just a simple email. So best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Can anybody think what theirs might be? Well, you got me thinking when you were bringing up opportunities for like the photos or yeah. video or maybe hosting a workshop yeah. yeah being creative so being creative sometimes it's about money often compensation is about a variety of different things we tend to go to money I'm not saying money is not important but it's also thinking is there are there other things of value that are going to happen in this particular engagement for me now, if you're always saying, it's gonna give me exposure, it's gonna give me experience, but you've been doing it 10 years and you keep sliding your fee, then you gotta stop telling yourself that because you've had enough exposure and you've had enough experience. Um, but thinking about what that alternative agreement might be. Can you go to the next one? So then the other thing you have to do, um, and in my class, I teach uh, very part-time at Champlain University, uh, negotiation, business negotiation, and one of the things that we really focus on is the other person. So what's the other person's bat nut? You're not gonna know, but you can guess, right? So your boss, is he gonna wanna lose the employee if he's focused on um, employee retention? Probably not. He is probably, he or she, or they, are probably 
uh, answering to somebody else. So thinking about what is their potential BATNA can be important. And the other piece is I always work really, really hard at whoever is hiring me to make, them, to make it easier for them to say yes. If that is sending them information, if that is showing up to an additional meeting, if that is giving them some sort of documentation, if it's, hey, you know, tell me how I can make this easier for you. People really appreciate it. Often people want to say yes. Even you know, people who are supervisors that are told they can't give raises, they often want to say yes. So being creative and trying to help them figure out how they can say yes. The one thing is if you are an employee, I just want to make sure I say this, don't wait till uh, your review. Salary determinations are made well before your actual performance review. So this should be an ongoing conversation that you have with whoever is in charge of that. So you need to anticipate objections. Get ready for the no. We don't like no's, but get ready for them. It could be, there are so many VP slots. There are, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. That's my favorite. Uh, I work with a lot of women that get that. And so it's like, you know, just do a hard, just work harder and it will come. Uh, it's not what we budgeted for. Like, what's your favorite objection? Yeah. I get all the time, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And how do you handle that objection? I challenge them to say, what is yet? You know, I work with aging in place, they'll be like 92. Oh. You know, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yet? there's a limited time. <laughs> I, and I try to focus on, you know, the goal is proactive, but not reactive. Yeah. Yeah. So you do a little education. You ask them what yet is. Yeah. Uh, a different way of framing that, which is similar, would be, um, so what would have to change in order for you to say yes? People haven't really thought it through, and you can't ask it like accusatory. It's just kind of, I'm curious. That's probably a better way than saying what is yet. <laughs> you know, what would have to change for us to move forward? Can I follow back up? There's so many VP spots, that's, um, that one is kind of like, well, tell me, um, you know, if we were to apply for another VP spot, what would that look like? What would have to happen? What, how would I have to perform? Or how would I eventually get one of those? It's just getting curious and getting more data. Uh, you can go to the next slide, because I want to make sure there's time for this last exercise. So you pause and slow down. Here's the hardest part, especially if you're an anxious person or a highly verbal person. Um, silence is okay. Often people are thinking and processing. I actually, when I used to do group therapy, my favorite story about silence is my group. I've been working with them a long time. It's this group of women once a week that come in. And at one point, because my brain can just go too fast. I mean, sometimes I stumble over my words because my brain's going too fast. And at one point the group was like, so Kathleen, if you could ask a question and just breathe for a minute. <laughs> I was like, oh, I've empowered the group. They told me to shut up. Uh, next one. Ask curious questions. If you go in curious as opposed to defensive and get really curious about if it's a no, what makes it a no? What are the deciding factors? How can we get to yes? And just, you know, just explore it. I know it's not easy to do because it can be emotional, but the curiosity can really be a key. Because it's hard to be curious and defensive at the same time. You try it. They don't tend to coexist. Next. Uh, reflect back the other person's their concern. So make sure you heard them, you know, the act of listening. You know, what I hear you're saying is in the next three months I would have to do X, Y, and Z. Is that correct? Is there anything else I'd have to do? I'm just going to put that in an email, confirm that with you, and then maybe in three, it, not maybe, in three months we'll follow up and have an appointment. Uh, success stories. This is key if you are an entrepreneur. Think about the successes you have had and how do you tell a story in a compelling, brief way in order to help somebody know, oh, she gets me or she can help me. Last one. Be persistent, but follow up. And sometimes you might follow up and you realize this isn't the client for me. This isn't the company for me. But you have to kind of follow up and be persistent. Often there's extenuating circumstances that, especially if you're someone who hasn't asked for your worth and then you're asking for your worth, it's going to take a while to get there. It doesn't mean that you've failed. It just means you need to take one more step and one more step. And when you follow up, 
Sometimes give them an extra day, that can be helpful. <laughs> Next. Yeah. The last is ask. You need to actually ask. I know that seems silly, but you need to get in this powerful place where you say, I am going to ask today, or I'm going to set up that meeting. So go ahead. Um, so when I talk about boost your confidence, think about it. What boosts your confidence? Do you have something, it doesn't have to relate to work, that really makes you feel like you're hot shit? Or powerful? For me, well, we're in mountain biking season, but I'll give you skiing. I love skiing. I love skiing Mad River Glen, and while it's not always pretty, when I get to the end of Paradise, which if you don't know skiing is a pretty hard uh, black diamond trail, I just feel like, yeah. So what do I do before I get on stage? What do I do before I go into negotiation? I imagine myself skiing down that. Or this week, I just had a really nice uh, mountain bike ride by myself. And, so that's for me, not everybody. I used to work with someone who had to tap and calm, and, but I have to kind of get that energy. So think about a time where you feel really confident and then imagine that right before you go in. And if you don't have something, use the power pose. Everybody stand up. Let's do it. We're almost done. Someone take a picture. <laughs> so don't you feel more powerful? Now go like this. How do you feel? Do you want to ask for a raise? <laughs> or do you want to ask for a raise? Or do you want to ask for a raise? <laughs> right? Isn't it fascinating? I just love that. Cool. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> what I would say is do it right before. That's a great question. Do it right before you enter. And in your head, you can sit down, take a deep breath, and in your mind's eye, be like, you could even imagine this room. Like, look at all these women. It's a great question. The other thing I want to say is have more than one ask. I think I've said that before. Negotiate a bundle. Because when you're negotiating a bundle, you're negotiating a bunch of things. You're not negotiating yes or no. You're negotiating which of these. It's a key thing. And research shows if you're going in as a woman and you want to negotiate and win, you don't let them go with the range. You do your research and give the range. It's a gender difference. I didn't drill down as to actually why that is, it just is. So if you want to make sure you're taking care of yourself, come up with a range and then go as high as you can because you negotiate down. We don't negotiate up. How do you come up with that range? That's where the research comes in. That's where the networking, that's where the communication. And you know what? At some point, you just you throw it out there and uh, you do the best you can. And the reaction to that range is going to give you more data. Yes? That's a different technique. I'm glad you asked that. No, I would not in a salary negotiation or in, in, in a situation where you weren't trying to find somebody's budget number. Um, I would get some, some data from people and try to see what the range is. So if you are shooting for, um, like for instance, I had a woman come to me. She was offered 120000 I said, what do you really want? And she goes, I really want 200000 200, but I want to go for one forty. And I said to her, I said, so that's like 60. So why don't you say it really, the range I would like to be in is 140 to 180. I said, could you say that? That's the other thing you have to practice saying it. She's like, I could. Now it's not the 200, but it's a lot more than she was making at her previous firm. She was so excited. Doesn't always work this way, but it did. She called me, she goes, oh my God, they gave me the 180. Oh. <laughs> yes, so you never know. So the range gives them some flexibility and it gives you some flexibility. And the worst thing is, they say, we can't meet your range. We're going to stick with the 120. In my time, I've never seen anybody, this is the other fear, get fired if you counteroffer. They usually just say no. They often give you something else, whatever the something else is, more money. They don't typically fire you. A lot of people are like, I'm going to lose the job offer. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> um, so those are the types of range. It's a nuanced. Um, range, can you hold that just so I can do this next piece? Um, but start high. Again, the idea is push yourself a little bit because you can settle for a little bit lower, but you have to give them some room to negotiate down. Now they may actually meet it. So let's go to the next slide because I want to, uh oh, you can, yeah. So when you say your range, be quiet. 
I've had people say this to me, oh, that's much more than we thought. And I go, oh, you know, I had a sense it was going to be that. And they don't know what to do with that, but because it's just like, you're like, yeah. So um, the quiet is key. It's hard to do. Practice it. Practice it. Go ahead. I have a trick for that. Oh, yeah. Like so I love a trick. silly thing, but in group facilitation, yep. it's the same thing. And so I just, after asking quite, I just feel like I can't. Mm -hmm. Each, I touch each finger, which is oh, you know, that's just, perfect. Yep, and almost always someone someone will add something. It's amazing. And ten seconds feels like forever for us, but it's not for the other person. The other thing is, I write a sticky note. Like if you're doing a virtual, like I have a lot of Zoom negotiations, and so I just put the sticky note that literally says, and you can use a nicer word if you want a nicer word. Mine's like shut up. Here's the number I'm asking for, the range, and shut up. Um, but that's a great idea. So very quickly, let's talk about things to avoid. You can just throw them up there. I already said this. Do not lie. Do not say you have another offer without having another offer. That's when people tend to lose their jobs. I don't think you're a bunch of liars. I'm just saying people are tempted. It's better to really work with transparency, truth. Don't give ultimatums unless you're willing to walk out. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever the case may be, as women, we are judged very negatively if we are aggressive. So use collaborative language. I think this would be good for the team if we do this together. If I was able to help all of us do blah, 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 for we have to really build on that relationship piece. I think that's the way negotiations going anyway for anybody, no matter how they identify from a gender standpoint. But don't sell yourself short. Next. That's what it feels like when you're a confident negotiator. I can't tell you how good it is. It isn't consistent, but it's more and more consistent. It just blows your mind because you walk into the room, and even if you don't get everything, you get a lot more if you're able to get yourself prepared and in this space. And remember, you have all these women in this room around you sending you good vibes that you can do it. The last thing I want to offer you before I let you go is, and you don't have to take me up on it, but you can, Often in these particular workshops, is it not going? What I want to do is help you take action, not that you haven't already today. But on your index card, I would like you to list one action. Well, actually, do you have an index card? Yeah, no, I, I think you need to go back. <laughs> oh, go back. That's just uh, so I have a whole coaching practice. Check me out if you want. Um, go back a slide, please. Nope, next one. I can tell you what it is. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you write down what your action step is. I'm going to have you write down um, a couple of things on this index card. And then if you want, I can email you the information in a month. Or I am a Gen Xer. I can mail it to you, um, which is what I did for a lot of people last year, in a month. Because what I want you to do is to remember what you took in this moment with you in a month when sometimes it falls by the wayside. So you'll list one doable action step. It isn't like, I'm going to change my whole career, start a business, charge everything I want. It's going to be more like, I'm going to start a success journal. Or I'm going to really think about my BATNA and the other person's BATNA. It could be, I'm going to listen to podcasts about this. It could, it could be anything. Keep it small, though. And I want you to have an accountability partner. I want you to have somebody could be somebody you met today. Sometimes people will do me. You don't have to, but I'm open to doing it. My limits are just like it's this one piece, but I'm happy to do it. Um, and then at the most important thing is at the bottom, I want you to write, I am worth it because. that's the part we forget. We need to take action and we re need to remind ourselves why we're worth it. And if for some reason you get stuck on that, turn to the partner that you work with today and they can write something down. Now in order to get this information to you, I need your name on that index card, if you want, you can put your email down. You don't have to. I can sign you up for some free negotiation tips if you want them. 
don't have to. If you want me to mail it to you, which I'm more than happy to do, and I have the stamps and everything already, is write your address on the envelope. So I need your name on the card in case they get separated with the envelope. Yeah. Sir, are we writing down our partner's name? No, or only, or no, you need an accountability partner. It could be someone that you work with today. It could be someone in your life. Just somebody that you're going to say, I'm taking this one action step as a result of this conference that I went to, and they're going to check back with you maybe in a week or two and see if you've made action, and then you're going to get this information from me in a month. So I was raised by a military captain. It is going to be 1146 by the time you get out. <laughs> so I need to apologize. I actually work with my speaking coach on that. I get like panicky. My dad was a good guy, but. <laughs> <laughs> so take your time finishing those. You don't have to abide by the military captain's rules of on time is on time uh, or early. But ultimately, this is what I wish for you. And I really, I'm out in the community. If you want to connect with me, please do. I'd be more than happy. I have free resources. I have paid coaching. But ultimately, if you got what you needed today, that is awesome. I want you to build your confidence. I want you to be able to communicate your value. And ultimately, I want you to earn more. I want you to earn what you're worth. And if I've made any impact today, it's totally been worth getting up and driving here <laughs> and putting on my new red jacket. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And a round of applause for Jillian. Woo! My clicker. <laughs> Thank you so much.